Um, a couple announcements with uh, with the community here today, just like something to celebrate. Uh, we we have five values here at Heaven Earth Church. Uh, one of them is that we want to bless the community through partnerships. Um, oh, what the heck? It won't take me that long. I can run through them real quick. Number one value for us, like these are these are ways of life that we want to learn to practice together. Number one is we want to meet people where they are and see them as masterpieces. Um, from Ephesians two ten, it says that every person is a masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works. Every single person you encounter, made in the image of God, and is a masterpiece. Uh, that's number one. Number two is we want to keep our eyes on Jesus and live by His Spirit. Um, in our world, there's so much division um, and, and sometimes good debate about issues, things that we need to be kind of wrestling with different sides of issues. One of the things we want to practice is like very simply, we want to just keep our eyes like, what did Jesus say? What did Jesus do? How did he live? We want to live likewise by the power of his Holy Spirit. Number three is that we want to practice the way of Jesus and not just talk the talk. And so... Um, that's why with our groups here, for instance, we don't have just Bible studies. We have, uh, we call them small groups or tiny churches they, who practice. Like when we get together, we're going to try different spiritual practices. We're going to walk the community together uh, because that's what Jesus did with his followers. They practiced together. They didn't just talk about things. They did things. Number four is we want to bless the community through partnerships, which I just mentioned in number five. We want to be responsible and grateful with what we are given. So those are our five values, the five values of Heaven Earth Church. And I celebrate when <clears throat> people in our community are living out those values. So yesterday, um, we had Christy and Mikey and Maureen and some of Maureen, uh, Maureen Waymeyer's student council students. Um, Clark Pleasant reached out to us and said, can you help us pull off a new event that we're having called Family University? And they hosted a bunch of parents and families, and it was a resource fair for parents and families to know, like, what resources are available to you in the community. They asked us to come and help um, with child care and food and anything else. And uh, I just celebrate that our folks were out there blessing the community through partnerships. So thank you to Christy and Mikey and Maureen for being there. Um, that's what we want to do. So uh, Christy, Mikey, any highlights, anything that I missed from that yesterday? I did get some good. Was... Cool, cool. Some some cool activities with the children. I got some good pictures that I'll be sure to share on social media, Mikey, because I know that's what you want. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that's something to celebrate, and uh, I'm happy for that. Um, hey, just a couple of things. So, number one, we are collecting items for... Uh, Michelle's Little Free Pantry. Every year they, they give out 100 free Thanksgiving baskets into the community they're already spoken for. When they put the sign up out, they were, the slots were filled in two hours. Um, so we're helping them fill those baskets with 400 cans of corn, 200 canned yams, 100 boxes of dried onions, and uh, 100 boxes of cornbread mix. So uh, we're still doing that. We have about a quarter to 30% of those items collected. Uh, the last days to turn in your items are Tuesday or Wednesday of this week. You can drop them off Tuesday from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. here at the church or uh, Wednesday evening from about 6 to 8.30. You can drop off items. Here's the secret. I'm going to let you in on a secret that I probably shouldn't tell you because it's going to it's going to demotivate you. Whatever you don't bring, the church is going to buy it and bring it and give them. But we'd rather if everybody could many hands make light work. So if you can chip in and help us out, that'd be the great way to go. Here's the reason that we can buy that stuff because this is the way our budget works. We don't talk a lot about this a lot. Um we don't spend a lot of money on programs. We believe that people are the programs of the church. People are the church. Um, so we don't, we don't have a huge budget. 
11 and a half percent or 12 percent of our of money that we have going we give right back out to state and global initiatives of the uh, united methodist church we give another five percent on top of that to local initiatives so we partner with local organizations they come to us like with what they have going on and we say okay we help with money we help with manpower woman power and so on and so forth so that's that's how we're able to bless Michelle's. And I'll, I'll share this last part too. We have yet another fund called the Benevolence Fund that someone donated $5,000 to that last year. Um, that also goes right back into the community. Whenever someone donates to local impact, 100% of that goes into the community. We have handed out, we've partnered with people and, and given out over four thousand dollars of that local impact monies into rent assistance utility assistance but we don't just help people we we say how can you help us because we believe everybody has a gift and um we help them hey is there is there a program or a resource in the community you may need that you're not aware of yet so um so yeah that's that's how the money works um we have a recovery church thanksgiving event on Wednesday at 6.30. So we're, we've got a turkey from Johnson's Barbecue. Our members are bringing sides. So this, what's different about this Wednesday's event is it's for folks actively seeking recovery, but also friends and family members of anyone seeking recovery. So we're going to have a big Thanksgiving meal. Um, we're also going to have some games and just a time to hang out for people to celebrate recovery as a community. And also for maybe some new folks to find this community of people that we call Recovery Church. Um, it's led by people who are in recovery. So that's Wednesday night at 630 right here at the church. Here's the last announcement. Next, you're like, Ross, this is a lot. I know. I'm sorry. I'm going to be done very soon. Next week, uh, Kids in Crisis Intervention Team, Kick It, one of our partner organizations, will have a truck right out in the parking lot from about 10 a.m. To, to noon because they're having a stuff the trunk event where they're stationing trucks throughout the community to restock their pantries. What does Kick It do? They resource kids and students ages 16 to 29 who are struggling with homelessness. It's the number one need in our county, a county according to the United Way, who did a needs assessment of our county. In this county, we have three of the top 45 school systems for students experience homelessness in the state. In this county, we have three of the top 45. It's a big problem. So, stuff the trunk next week. Here are the items. We'll put this up on social media as well. Pop top canned soup or ravioli, individually wrapped snacks or breakfast items, microwave popcorn, hand soap, laundry detergent, paper products, cleaning supplies, fast food gift cards, and notes of encouragement. If you're like, Ross, I can't remember that. We'll put it out on social media. We'll put it out in the email. If you're not getting the email, fill out a Let's Connect card. Drop it in the basket at the back. We'll get you on our email list. Or you can just put your email in the comments online. We did it. Announcements. Did I put you to sleep? Is everybody all right? Do you need to do some jumping jacks? Need a donut? The donut made my son literally run around this morning and like wallow around the floor. People witnessed it, right? Can I get a witness? Um, oh, it's my it's my mother-in-law's birthday. Yes, that's that's very important. Thank you, whoever did that. Any other birthdays today? Any other birthdays that are coming up nearby? No. Any uh, anniversaries or anything like that coming up? No? How about sobriety anniversaries, anybody? We celebrate those around here. All right. Well, we are going to go on to our Sunday conversation. It's what you would call a sermon and uh, other things. Josh, can you throw that image up on the screen? If you're at home, I don't think you can see this but it was on our Facebook. Uh, we're starting a new series. And you're thinking to yourself, if you're new online or you're new in person, you're like, good Lord, I came to church today for the first time. 
and they're talking about money. <laughs> Dang! <laughs> That's the last thing I wanted to hear at church. When I did a... Uh, the first six months when I got here, we're starting a series called Money Problems, what Jesus has to say about money. When I did... Uh, when I first got here, I spent six months just walking around the community, literally and metaphorically, listening to people's stories. Like, what's going on in your life? What's going on with your faith? The second reason, according to data, and I also heard it backed up in stories, the second reason, according to Mission Insight, that people in this area don't participate in religion is how the church handles and talks about money. It's the second reason. People don't want the church to talk about money because they don't trust the way the church talks about money and the way the church handles money. I heard that backed up. I heard a story. I remember it was at Johnson's Barbecue for a trivia event. Somebody had quit church. And uh, we, just, we used to host these trivia nights at Johnson's. Just a fun night to meet people, and we would feature one of our local partners. And somebody had quit church. And I just said... Uh, I mentioned somewhere along the way, we're never going to build a building. And someone stopped me afterwards. They said, what do you mean you're never going to build a building? And she went on to describe how she quit church for the reason that she got, she said, I'm okay with tithing. And first of all, that shocked me. Like, I'm okay with like giving my money, but I got sick and tired of the church asking for money for things that I didn't feel we're going to the things Jesus would have us do. Anybody feel that way? Thank you for sharing that. I feel that way. I've been a part of churches where when they started talking about money, I didn't like it because I didn't, I didn't trust them, to be honest with you. I didn't... And that would bring up a crisis for me like, well, if I don't trust the way my church is handling money, why am I here? So I realize that when we start talking about this, it's very personal. I know that. Because we all have money problems in various capacities. And many of us don't trust the way the church talks about money. So I hear that. Uh, with that being said, that's the question I want to ask you. The minute I said that I, we were going to talk about money problems, we were going to talk about money for the next three weeks, what did you feel? In a word or a phrase, uh, Christy, are you handling comments online? Please pass them along. What did you feel? What did you say? Crap. You felt like crap. Thank you for being honest. We're glad you're here. Going to fit right in. We have a lot of honesty around here. So, so it makes the conversation good. What else? Anybody else feel that way? You feel like it's something that has to be said? Okay. I would feel like you felt. I always felt that way. What do you feel? What did you feel when, when I said we're, for the next three weeks we're going to talk about money? We're going to talk about money problems. What Jesus has to say about money. We have an uncomfortable and we have a glad. Well, that's pretty far apart, but all right. A little excited because it's an area that I need a little more help with. Okay. What else? What do you feel? What do you feel when I said for the next three weeks we're going to talk about money? You feel, Don, that are you going to have enough money to help out? Is that what you said? Am I going to have enough? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that.
Angie says God knows how much you need and when you need it, and God will provide. That's been your experience. Thank you for sharing that, Angie. I appreciate that. Guilt. Somebody feels guilt. Yeah. Yeah. Next question. It's a classic question. Um, if you, do we need to do jumping jacks? Are you okay? All right. All right. I know. I know that it's dark outside. It's snowing. I mean, oh yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, I'm gonna ask it. Can money buy you happiness? That was fast. <laughs> There was a resounding, like, murmuring, like a, a, a wave of no. It can buy you things that can make you happy for just a little bit. It, it can be a source of happiness. Okay? Yeah. You like buying things for your kids? You like to see them happy? Gives you gives you happiness? Yeah. Being able to help people out. Yeah. Any anything online, Christy? It makes me feel like not watching or attending. Stay tuned, please. So, I need to give you a preview for the next three weeks. Not once will I be asking you to give to the church in the next three weeks. Not one time. That's not what this series is about I will not ask you to give to the church one time. I won't do it indirectly. I am simply here. What does Jesus say about money? Whatever you do with that, that's what you choose to do with that. I, I've said to you before, I mean it. Uh, I, Man, if, if you never give to this church, then you can always participate in the life of the church. You know? That's not like a, all right, uh, Josh or Chris, I noticed on your records here, <laughs> that's, not, that's not a thing, you know? I'm here today to talk about, like, for the next three weeks, like, Jesus talked about money more than He talked about hell. We said that Jesus, the, the word hell appears a total of 13 times in the entire Bible. Jesus talks about money a lot more than that. He talks about money as someone who did not have a lot of it. Jesus uh, was a person born, uh, born as, a, as a poor carpenter in a neighborhood of poor folks. He lived in a world where there was no middle class. 90% of people, according to Bart Ehrman, couldn't read or write. To have one healthy baby survive into adolescence and adulthood, you had to have five. That is the world that Jesus lived in. When He talks about money, He's talking as someone who doesn't have it. So hear Him through that. Let Jesus talk to you about money as someone who didn't have it and someone who did not spend his life trying to get it. However, He did try to create a world where people like Him didn't have to grind so hard literally for a loaf of bread. To get a loaf of bread, you had to take grain from the field, put it on a millstone, and get your donkey to, to drive another stone around to grind up the grain to create flour to create a loaf of bread. That's the world Jesus comes from. Why Jesus said things like, you can't worship two masters, you either love the one or hate the other. 
because he lived in a world where people like him got ruled over by people who had a lot of money. And they felt powerless because they didn't have any money. And he watched those people who were trying to get more money, like almost worshiping a god, which Jesus called Mammon. It was the god of wealth. He saw that and he's like, that is creating a bunch of problems in our world. People are serving the master of wealth and it's creating more injustice and more crud in our world. But you know what he also saw amongst his peers? And he tried to liberate them from it too? They watched the people with more and said, God, if I could just be like that. And Jesus is like, no! No! Jesus tried to teach everyone the answer is not the answer to our money problems is not getting more necessarily. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute because some people legitimately need more. But today like I said, we're just going to talk about we're going to start off a 3-week series. Has anybody ever watched a limited series on Netflix? You know, not like a show where it's got seven seasons with 20 episodes apiece, but it's a show that's got three episodes that are about an hour apiece. Any favorites, limited series that you can think of off the top of your head? Catching Killers, okay. It's a limited series. There was a Morgan Freeman one that was about God, yeah. This week, the next three weeks, we're going to do a limited series on one story in the Bible. It's like we're going to break it down like a Netflix series. Like we're going to take long, like three week look at one story. It's an interaction that Jesus has with a rich ruler. You've probably heard the story, but if you're like me, this is a story we could never fully understand or exhaust its value or meaning. There are two times in the Gospel of Luke, in in one account of Jesus' life, where a person comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to obtain eternal life? We just finished a series where we looked at the first instance. Jesus starts a journey from from Galilee, his home area, up north in Israel, down south to Jerusalem. In Luke, that journey is documented from Luke chapter 9 to Luke chapter 19. At the beginning of that journey, there's a lawyer who comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to obtain eternal life? Jesus says, what do you make of the first five books of the the Bible, buddy? And he says, well, I pretty much think it's about love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, do this and you will be alive. And then he says, who's my neighbor? And then Jesus tells the story of the Samaritan the Good Samaritan. We are now looking at the second instance in Luke where somebody comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to obtain eternal life? But now we're looking at the end of Jesus' journey to Jerusalem in chapter 18 of Luke where a rich ruler comes to Jesus and says that question, what must I do to obtain eternal life? So, you get where we're going with this for the next three weeks? I'm not going to ask you to give once. I'm asking you to really wrestle with what does Jesus had to say about money. All right? Um, so here's the story. Let's look at, uh, if you want to follow along, it's in Luke chapter 18. If not, I'm just going to read it. And before I do that, I... I uh, I thought long and hard about about this series. I probably did a little bit more preparation for this series in this week than I've done in a long time because I know money is such a sensitive subject. Um, and I'm actually going to read you, like, as I never do, uh, the one thing that I'm inviting us to consider together the next few weeks. Um, before I read this, the one thing that I'm, uh, or really this is a few things. My one thing, typically, let you mind the curtain, I typically have like one sentence that I want to talk about when we get together. Well, 
This time it's about six sentences because it's so complicated. I ask you to think about this. Jesus traveled his journey on earth to fight the forces of evil and death that are destroying life as God intended it. Jesus traveled this way to defeat the ways of life that have become normal on earth and show us the way of life that is normal in the kingdom of heaven. He comes to invite us to travel with Him all of our lives, for the rest of our lives, and for all of eternity. That's the cool thing about Jesus. You can start traveling a way now that continues on into eternity. Specifically when it comes to money. Jesus comes to free us from the mirage that getting more will save us. He comes to show us His view of money which gives us and the world abundant and eternal life. All right, let's hear the story and then we'll come back to that one thing. Luke 18, here's where we're going to stop. We're, we're not going to do the whole story. The whole text is 18. Uh, chapter 18, verses 18 to 30. Today, we are just going to verse 26. So that's where our first episode in the limited series will cut off. You ready? A certain ruler asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to obtain eternal life? Jesus replied, Why do you call me good? No one is good except the one God. You know the commandments, Jesus says, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't give false testimony, honor your father and mother. Then the ruler said, I've kept all those since I was a boy. Jesus, when Jesus heard this, he said, there's one more thing. Do you know what he says? What's the one more thing? Jesus says, there's one more thing. He says, you've heard the commandments. The guy goes, I've kept them since I was a boy. Jesus says, oh yeah, there's one more thing. Sell everything you own and distribute the money to the poor. Easy enough, right? Sell everything you own and distribute the money to the poor. That's what Jesus has to say about money. Then you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. When he heard these words, the man became sad because he was extremely rich. When Jesus said that, saw this, he said, it's very hard for the wealthy to enter God's kingdom. I need to create a quick caveat. A couple of chapters ago, Jesus talks to a, uh, a religious sort of expert in his time, and he talks about how those religious experts can't tell how God's kingdom is already happening among them. He says, it's already here. If you had eyes to see, you would see how like the kingdom of God is moving into earth and it's going to take over all things and restore all things. If you had eyes to see, you would see it. So Jesus is saying like literally, it's hard for a wealthy person to wake up and enter into God's kingdom and live for it now. It's easier for a camel to squeeze through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter God's kingdom. Those who heard this said, and here would be the end of our episode, episode one. Who's going to produce this for us, by the way? We need a producer, director, some people acting and all that. Those who heard this said, then who can be saved? Who can live up to this standard? How do you make sense of this story? Go ahead. Now it's, now it's up to you. What do you hear? or What thoughts do you have as you hear this, this interaction? The more you give, the more you receive. That's what Angie hears. Can't take it with you. 
Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. What else do you hear in this story? Even when people have all they need, they still are kind of imprisoned in this train of thought. I got I still gotta get more. Thank you for sharing that. What else do you hear in this story? What comes to your head and your heart as you hear it? Somebody's quoting the Bible back to us. It's my wife. I was going to say, that sounds like something might be talked about in my house. <laughs> to him who much is given, much is expected. Yeah. Yeah. So Josh is saying he thinks for this guy, it, it wasn't just the money. It was the lifestyle that came with his money. It was the way of life that he'd learned. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so Don brings up like he she thinks it really tested this man's faith. Yeah. And because he shows himself like to be a person this guy in this story, I will show my hand a little bit. People always destroy, I've heard a lot of people destroy the rich young ruler when they talk about this story. Listen to this. This guy takes time to like find Jesus wherever he is. Jesus is traveling through town. He's not going to be there long. This guy hears about it and he finds him. And he says, I, I want to go ask him a question. So he takes time to like go find Jesus and ask him a question. That's a sign of faith. Jesus says, have you heard about the commandments? He's like, I've been doing it since I was a little boy. That's also a sign of faith. When Jesus says this thing to him about sell everything you have, he doesn't say, well, never mind. Some curse words are coming to my head that he could say back to Jesus. He's not, he doesn't get angry. He's sad. He's grieved. His, his faith, it's, it's te he's tested to his core. Anything else? Aha! Yes! Literally! Oh my gosh! <laughs> the last thing one of the last things on my little outline here is jesus serious question mark man that's a tough one yeah Right. Where's the line? I had a friend, uh, a really good friend. He was just asking one day, almost like the same kind of question. He was like, so Ross, I mean, like, should I sell my house and my cars? And initially I'm going to go, no, 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 no. That's not what it's. And I, and I, all I could say was, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, Katie, right? So Katie brings up like how, like, I love this perspective because it really helps us to consider like, this was not going to be a small change in this guy's way of life. This was going to be a massive overhaul if he did it. Like a massive overhaul of life. A couple things to consider, and then episode one will be done for today. I hope for the next three weeks we can swim around in this story. Let it challenge us. 
I have read this story probably at this point hundreds of times in my life. It challenged me all the same this week. It made my wife and I have conversations at home in our van ride to, to Indiana Caverns yesterday. We were talking about this story, about how we should be living, all that stuff. Here's one thing. I, I don't know a lot about this story. I don't know if Jesus is serious. I don't know. I do know this. Maybe the right question is not, can money buy you happiness? Because I tend to agree with Katie, actually. I think there are some people who legitimately need more. If they had a higher wage and they weren't living paycheck to paycheck, you know, like a single parent with three kids, if they had a little bit more, I think, I think it could give them a potential for happiness that they don't currently have. Maybe. Some people legitimately have, don't have enough. Some people are grinding, grinding week in and week out to provide for their loved ones. And it's hard. If you want to do a fun exercise, and by fun I mean challenging, Google MIT Living Wage Calculator. It says what it costs to live in every county in America. It is eye-opening. Eye-opening. I think that question that we've been preoccupied with, we all know at the core of things, money can't itself buy you happiness. We'd all be like, nope, nope, nope. Doesn't buy you happiness. Maybe that's a bad question. Maybe the question that comes to my mind as I read this story is like, what if there is a way of life that is truly better for us and we haven't known it yet? And, and I mean... I'm not even talking about a faith question. Now let me frame it in a faith question kind of way. What if there is a way of life that is eternal in the sense that like God created it, like God knows how humans are supposed to live. It's like the best way for us to live. It's both eternal in that way, and also if we start living that way now, it has a way of lasting forever. Like in a weird way, like if we died and woke up with God, it'd be like, oh, that's surprising, not much changed. Because I was already living the kingdom of what kingdom of heaven way. What if there's a way of life that's that's awesome and from God that we haven't fully tasted yet? And Jesus is asking this guy this question, saying it back to him to say, I'm inviting you to taste something you haven't yet. Because Jesus People sometimes think Jesus is like, huh, watch this. I'm gonna <laughs> God, I'm gonna get this guy. <laughs> watch this. Hey, one more thing. <laughs> watch this. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. I think Jesus, I've said this before. Um, I think Jesus had a was was really good at uh doing like uh, EKGs on people. He could look into people's hearts and see how they were functioning. At a very deep level. I think he looked deeply into this guy's heart and he saw one thing, one thing that was keeping him from seeing the kingdom of God like right now. From seeing the, this way of life right now. Think about it. Jesus says there's one more thing. When you step back and think about it, it's like on the one hand, Jesus is telling him like, on this thing, you're very far from God's view. When it comes to money, rich ruler guy, you're really far from God in your heart on this one thing. And I know you're really far because you literally asked me what you could do to obtain eternal life. Like eternal life is just one more thing you can buy on your list, like a yacht or a mansion. Your heart when it comes to money is set on obtaining, on acquiring one thing after the other. It's your drug. On the one hand, Jesus is telling him how far off he is on that one thing, but think about it. Jesus is also telling him how close he is. If it's just one thing, if it's just one thing, if this guy changed his view and his heart and life on that one thing, Jesus is saying, like, you're going to, like, something explosive is going to happen in your life. 
You're going to wake up. He says, do this and come follow me. Jesus isn't trying to scare him away. He's inviting him closer. So here, here's my question for you as we begin to close up this episode for today. Maybe it's not money for you. What's the one thing for you? In your heart, in your life. If Jesus were to do an EKG on, on Dave or Betty or Charlotte or Angie, Don, Katie, Christy, Mikey, Josh, Patty, Dad, we'll let Boaz off the hook today. Chris, Joanna, Jason, John, Sandra, Shane, everyone online. If Jesus were to hook you up to an EKG and he were to look, look in there and be like, they're close. Real close. But just one thing. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's not. Jesus is in the business of inviting people closer. He won't make you come closer. That's not relationship. Force doesn't make for relationship. That's why Jesus is always in the game of inviting. Invitation. Come closer. You're close. Yeah, you're really far on this one thing. But if you change that one thing, you're close. You're closer than you've ever dreamed of. Makes me think of Lewis and Clark in their journals. They made it all that way, almost to the Pacific Ocean. Their journals say that right when they are on the cusp of seeing the wonder of the Pacific Ocean, they were about to quit. They were about to quit. They didn't know how close they were. You're that close. You're that close. Let Jesus show you how to get, how to get closer. Uh, this is it for today. Is Jesus serious? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not going to answer that. I'll let you wrestle with it this week. Do you think Jesus is serious with this guy? I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. I will, t okay, fine, one more story, and then I swear this is it. We lived with a guy, a 